At the Sports History Network, we're proud to introduce you to a new sponsor for our podcasts. It's Home Field Apparel, your premium collegiate apparel brand right out of Indianapolis. They've got incredibly comfortable t-shirts, plus they're officially licensed with vintage college designs. They have over 150 plus colleges available now and always adding more. Homefield digs through the archives and history of your school to find unique logos, mascots, and moments to make thoughtful designs for your school. When you shop today, New customers can get a 15% discount off their first purchase using the promo code SPORTSHISTORY at checkout. You can learn more at homefieldapparel.com. This is Basketball History 101 with Rick Loiza. Welcome back to the award-winning Basketball History 101, part of the Sports History Network. I am your host, Rick Loiza, and this is the podcast where we bring to life some of the forgotten stories from basketball history. We are bringing old-school basketball to a new-school audience. And today, we bring you the story of the 1977 NBA All-Star Game held in Milwaukee. This was the first All-Star Game after the merger of the NBA and the ABA. Two leagues were now one league. If you want to hear more about the actual merger between these two leagues, then go back to episode 29 where I go into detail on how these two leagues negotiated the merger. Now the reason I wanted to do this story is to share what it was like at the time for the two leagues to join together as one league. Most NBA fans had never seen the ABA players because they were almost never on TV. The opinion that most NBA fans had of the ABA went in one of two directions. Either they were extremely excited to see these players since they had only heard about them. Guys like Dr. J had established a mythical quality about them. People talked about him dunking over everyone like he flew out of the rafters. Talking about Dr. J to an NBA fan was like talking about Zeus or Thor. They wanted to find out what these dudes were all about. The other way that some NBA fans thought was that these ABA guys could not be that good or else they would be in the NBA already. So they were not expecting much. They thought that Dr. J and George Gervin were scoring against a bunch of stiffs, therefore making their numbers inflated. The NBA players were not much better. Many of them considered the ABA to be glorified streetball. The NBA was real basketball. Most NBA players were looking forward to destroying some of these new ABA guys that were joining the big boy league. And as you will see, none of these opinions were correct. These ABA players were not gods coming down from Mount Olympus and nor were they a bunch of trash players. They were fantastic players that were just playing in a different league for a while. So this is a quick overview of how the two leagues came together. The NBA was the established league with most of the great players on any one of their teams. It had more newspaper coverage, far better ticket sales, and most importantly, a lucrative TV contract. The ABA was an upstart league where the teams were coming and going every season. Teams relocated constantly. New teams were added almost every year as existing teams were going completely out of business. Other teams rebranded with new names each time they were sold to a new owner. It was a bit chaotic. There were instances where a team was on a road trip and then told they did not have to play the last game of the trip because the opponent had just gone out of business and they were no longer part of the league. Now think about that for a moment. Imagine if you are a fan of the Houston Rockets and the team is on an East Coast road trip. They are scheduled to play the Washington Wizards in two days. Then they suddenly get a call from the league office telling them that the Wizards just went completely out of business and they did not need to make the trip. They could just go home and the league would try to make up the lost game against a different opponent. It. Anyway, at the end of the 1976 season, the owners of the ABA were able to negotiate a merger with the far more established NBA. And just for the sake of context, it was not like the NBA teams had never gone out of business. But the last team to go out of business from the NBA was the Baltimore Bullets back in 1954. The NBA had become a stable money-making league. Anyway, that all leads me to the main topic for our story for today, the 1977 NBA All-Star Game. This was going to be the first All-Star Game after the merger. Up until this point, the NBA owners and players looked down on the ABA as I mentioned. The ABA made far less money and mostly played in much smaller cities. There were a number of NBA players who had spent time in the ABA and knew firsthand that the ABA was a shoestring operation. Again, the NBA played what they like to call 
real basketball. And by that, they meant that most teams had a big man who played the post and everyone else organized themselves around the big man. Everything about the NBA was fundamentally sound and efficient. Back in the 1970s, if you were anywhere near seven feet tall, then you could command a premium salary because the power position was the center position. And I'm talking about guys like Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, Wilt Chamberlain, Bill Walton, Willis Reed, Dave Cowens, Bob Lanier, Nate Thurman, Wes Unselt, and Elvin Hayes. These were the centers that dominated the 1970s. In fact, if you go through the championship teams of the 1970s from the NBA, nine out of the 10 teams had an all-star player at the center position. The only exception was the 1975 Golden State Warriors. That is how important it was to have an all-star in the middle. But again, the ABA did not have that many big men because most of them went to the NBA for a higher salary. That means that the ABA, with apologies to Artis Gilmore, was a smaller man's league. The ABA also had the three-point line, which the NBA did not. The three-point line helped to spread the floor and create driving lanes as certain players would hang out outside the three-point line pulling their defenders with them. In the NBA, the dunk was considered rude and not used that often. Even Will Chamberlain would finger roll a lot of point blank shots. In the ABA, the dunk was celebrated. The ABA understood something very well that took time for the NBA to figure out. What the ABA knew was that they were an entertainment organization. Fans buy tickets when they feel they will be entertained. And the dunk was very entertaining. The ABA had a lot more street ball in its DNA, and I say that as a compliment. The NBA was filled almost exclusively with players who had attended and graduated college. Meanwhile, the ABA had players who, in some cases, were literally signed directly from a playground court. The ABA was fun and funky, and it was a fast-paced, wide-open game, and it was amazing to watch. The merger was not just the merger of two basketball leagues, it was the merger of two completely different styles of basketball. But for the fan, it was heaven. It united all of the best players from these two leagues into a single league. In the NBA and among NBA fans, there were these mythological legends of a player by the name of Dr. J. At the top of the episode, I talked about how some ABA players were treated like Greek gods. Well, here is one myth about Dr. J that was very popular. People said that he could dunk the ball, grab the ball out of the net, and then dunk it again before coming down to the ground. They said that you could see his afro flutter in the wind as he raced down court for a jaw-dropping dunk. Well, that part was true. His afro did flutter. Everyone in the NBA wanted to see how good this guy really was. Was the hype for real? Or was it just overselling by the ABA? Hardly anyone had ever seen the doctor prior to his joining the NBA. But they were going to see him now. Well, this is a good place to take a break and I'll be right back with the actual 1977 All-Star Game and its implications. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. At the Sports History Network, we're all about sports yesteryear, and so we're so pleased to introduce you to Row One, an online memorabilia gallery and shop that brings your sports history to life anywhere. The Row One Gallery includes over 5,200 gorgeously reproduced prints of team posters, game program covers, game tickets, advertisements, and more in baseball, pro and college football, pro and college basketball, and more. And any gallery item may be printed in a variety of sizes on wood, metal, canvas, acrylic, or poster paper. And in Row One Shop, check out the thousands more of unique Unique items with a retro and historical designs dating back to 1876, including t-shirts, long sleeve shirts, phone cases, mugs, blankets, pillows, towels, and even shower curtains. Go to sportshistorynetwork.com, R-O-W number one, for access to the full Row 1 catalog and for gallery prints and gift items, plus get a 15% discount off all prints on the Row 1 Pictorum Gallery with coupon code SHN15. Follow the link on the show notes. Welcome back to the show and let us continue with the story of the 1977 NBA All-Star Game, the first one after the NBA and ABA merged into a single league. As I mentioned before the break, the more established and old school NBA looked down at the ABA as all flash and no substance. These ABA players were going to find out what real basketball looked like in the NBA and what real NBA players were like. Now let me provide some context here. In the few years prior to the merger, the NBA and ABA were playing each other in preseason games. The ABA teams won their fair share of these games, but these were preseason games and did not count for anything. The NBA still considered itself the top dog, but the All-Star Game was a good test of just how good the ABA was. 
Now first, let me start with the all-star team from the Western Conference. The starters were Paul Westfall, David Thompson, Bobby Jones, Norm Van Leer, and Dan Issel. Thompson, Jones, and Issel were all from the Denver Nuggets, which was one of the ABA teams. In other words, three of the five starters for the West had played in the ABA the year before, and all three played for Denver. Three of the reserves for the West also played in the ABA the year before. Those players were Don Buse and Billy Knight from the Indiana Pacers, as well as Maurice Lucas, who was on the Portland Trailblazers that year, but played for the Kentucky Colonels the year before in the ABA. Also, Don Buse led the entire NBA in assists that year. So, for the Western Conference, literally half the team had played in the ABA the year before. Now, I would say that this proved that the ABA had some real players in their league. Players obviously good enough to make the NBA All-Star Game in their first year in the league. I also want to mention that Rick Barry from the Golden State Warriors was also on that All-Star team from the West, and he had previously played four seasons in the NBA just not the year directly preceding the merger. As for the Eastern Conference, they had one starter who played in the ABA the year before, and that player was Dr. J, Julia Serving, who was also the MVP of that All-Star game. One reserve for the East had also played in the ABA the year before, and that was George the Iceman Gervin, who would win four scoring titles in the NBA. The team from the East also had George McGinnis, who had also previously played in the ABA, just not the year before the merger. So let me just sum that up for you. Of the 24 All-Star players in 1977, eight of them had played in the ABA the year before. That is one third of all the All-Stars, which means that the ABA was overrepresented. Let me explain. Only four ABA teams joined the NBA as part of the merger agreement. That meant that the four old ABA teams represented only 18% of the NBA since there were 22 total teams, but they produced 33% of the All-Stars. And then when you throw in Rick Barry and George McGinnis, this means that 10 out of the 24 NBA All-Stars had played in the ABA at some point in their careers. This proved to the NBA establishment and to the NBA fan that the ABA was a really good league and it had some amazing players. And that wide open, freewheeling style of play became extremely popular in the NBA. The NBA finally realized that maybe they could learn a thing or two from the ABA. The ABA style was a lot more fun to watch, which meant increased ticket sales. So while the current league is still called the NBA, the style of play that we see today in 2022 is very much ABA. The legacy of the old league still exists. We now have the three-point line, the dunk contest, fast-paced games, and even the multicolored ball during All-Star Saturday night. The DNA of the ABA has woven itself completely through the current NBA. And that is a good thing for all of us who love basketball. The ABA was for real, despite the fact that they were always on shaky financial ground. Even though the players sometimes had trouble getting their checks cashed, the product on the court was breathtaking. I just wish they were able to record more of those old ABA games. As for the All-Star game itself, both Julius Irving and Bob McAdoo scored 30 points to lead all scores, but only one of them could win MVP, and the writers voted for Julius Irving. The game was back and forth the whole way, but the West was triumphant and won the game by a single point, 125 to 124. The ABA had more than proven itself. It was a good brand of basketball, and now everybody knew it. If the NBA ever decides to expand, I would not mind seeing a revival of the old Kentucky Colonels or the Spirits of St. Louis. Those were some great teams, and the locations do not currently have an NBA team. Those markets are wide open. Well, that is it for today. Join us next time when we share the story of Perry Wallace. He was the first black player to play in the Southeastern Conference or SEC. He was Nashville raised and stayed home to play for Vanderbilt University. That's next time on Basketball History 101, part of the Sports History Network, the headquarters of Sports Yesteryear. Go to sportshistorynetwork.com to find out more about this and other sports history podcasts. If you like what you hear, please hit that subscribe button wherever you get your podcasts. And check out our page on Facebook. It's called Basketball History 101 Podcast. There you will find shorter historical posts as well as comments and discussion starters on today's game. I'll also announce there when new episodes come out. I want to thank my producer and editor, Jacob Loiza. Join us each week as we continue to mine the history of basketball for more great stories from the past. Take care and see you soon. Newspaper circa 1924. But for Marla Delft, assistant editor, everything was about to change.
for she was about to discover the awesome attractiveness of Row 1 brand retro sports paraphernalia items thanks to Orville Mulligan, sports writer. And there it is. Wow, Orville, that's really the bee's knees. Isn't it just? A poster-sized replica of the actual 1909 World Series program cover. I can see that. But where did you get it? And where'd you get it framed? I ordered it from the Row 1 website, where over 6,000 items of sports memorabilia from the 1880s to the 1990s are available for reproduction, in multiple sizes and in several different materials, with over a dozen styles of frame to choose from for prints like this. Well, I'm sure Mr. Delft would love to put up more of these in the office. But I'm equally as sure they're beyond this newspaper's budget. <laughs> Not at all, my dear Marla. See for yourself. Go to sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one. Sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one. Oh my, these are good prices. Oh, and look at this stuff. Oklahoma, Nebraska football. College basketball art. Michael Jordan items. And so Retro it was that Marla Delt discovered the spondiferous magic of Row 1 sports memorabilia arts and prints. You can, too, by visiting sportshistorynetwork.com slash row1. That's R-O-W number one today for access to the full Row 1 catalog of gallery prints and gifts like t-shirts, long sleeve shirts, telephone cases, coffee mugs, blankets, pillows, towels, and even shower curtains. Act today for a 15% discount off all prints with coupon code SHN15 and 20% off all other items with coupon code SHN20 at checkout. And keep your dial locked to the Sports History Network for the exciting chronicles of the 1920 sports world in Orville Mulligan, sports writer, coming soon. Okay,